Good morning. I'm standing outside St. Bartholomew's Church at the corner where the cornerstone, the original cornerstone that was laid on May 9th, 1868, has been repositioned. And this was necessitated because in the 1920s an addition was put on where our organ is now. So we recall the history of St. Bartholomew's on this day, as of course on St. Bartholomew's Day, August the 24th. But this is when the stone was laid and the church building, which began on May 9th, was ready for service on Christmas Day of that same year, 1868. And here's some information about that day that comes from our history called Faithful. Cornerstone was laid on Saturday, May 9th, by His Excellency the Governor General, Lord Monk. When everything was ready, Reverend G. N. Higginson, the incumbent, assisted by attending ministers, commenced the service by saying, Our help is in the hands of the Lord who has made heaven and earth. After which he read the eighth psalm, then kneeling, several colics were said. Then all standing up, the clergyman began, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth in him shall not be confounded. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Then His Excellency Lord Monk advanced to the cornerstone and placing his hand upon it said, in the faith of Jesus Christ, this cornerstone is laid in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here may true faith, the fear of God, and brotherly love ever remain. Amen. To which the clergy and people responded, This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. It goes on to say that Psalm 100 was sung, and we will be singing that song in our psalm in our service, and that the service concluded with the colic for St. Bartholomew, and we will have that in our service too. Thanks be to God, which givest us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to St. Bartholomew's on this, our Cornerstone Day and Battle of the Atlantic Sunday. The first Sunday in May, we remember the Battle of the Atlantic, which kept the lanes of shipping open between North America, especially Canada and Great Britain. Those who perished in both the Merchant Navy and the military and we also honor the valor of those who survive. And here in our parish, we remember a number of people who are now only with us in spirit. Admirals Ralph Hennessy and Dan Menge, Lieutenant Charles Kiefer, who plunged into the sea to save a woman who had been torpedoed, whose ship had been torpedoed and perished in doing so in 1945. Captain Fred Sherwood, the only Canadian to ever command a British submarine. His wife, Mary, a Wren in the British Navy. And my own mother, who was a Wren in the Canadian Navy, supplied the ships from Halifax. We also remember two others who took part in military operations in England at the time, Joyce Bryant and Mary Raymond. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the head cornerstone, grant that in the power of the Holy Spirit, 
those who serve you here in St. Bartholomew's Parish may always be kept within your presence. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O eternal Lord God, who alone spreadest out the heavens and rulest the raging of the sea, who has compassed the waters with bounds until day and night come to an end, we give you thanks for all who have served in the Royal Canadian Navy and the Merchant Navy, the British Navy, especially during the Battle of the Atlantic. Be pleased to receive into thy almighty and most gracious protection all those who this day are on active duty in Canada and abroad. Preserve them from the dangers of the sea and grant that they may return in safety to enjoy the blessings of the land and with a thankful remembrance of thy mercies to praise and glorify thy holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. As most of you know, we are the chapel of the Governor General's Foot Guards and have been so unofficially from 1872 when they began to 1972, a hundred year, their 100-year hundred anniversary when we became their official chapel. And the guards are very much part of this parish. And the Foot Guards Band, a wonderful band, has recorded this version of Eternal Fathers Strong to Save. O Lord, open thou our lips. O 
God, make speed to save us. Oh Lord, make peace to heaven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the first letter of John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know, and we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love of God has had the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Uh, but Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears 
has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's only since 2017 that we began to mark Cornerstone Day as a celebration at St. Bartholomew's. St. Bartholomew's Day is August 24th. Not a good day to gather a lot of people at the end of the summer. And so this is a good time to do it. And indeed, we had quite a party on the cornerstone day of 2017. But this year and last year, of course, not at all. And so it gives, has given us a chance to think about what church means. On a day we call Cornerstone, we do think of tangible things, a building, putting it up, an edifice, the gate of heaven, all those things are appropriate. But it's been a year and we haven't been able to come to this wonderful building, except virtually. And yet we still are together. So that's a real teaching in itself that the church may be an outward invisible sign, but the inner workings of the spirit is something not as tangible. Indeed, the history of the church called faithful reflects God's faithfulness to us. It's instinctive to think of our faithfulness to the building, to the community, to God, but I think we have to think about it the other way around. God has somehow been faithful to us and used this building and the spirit that emanates here, this thin place as a way to represent something that's not quite solid, but in many ways as more important. So all those things we bring together in this day of remembering our church history. And what a colorful history it was at the beginning. And until that book was written, we really didn't know very much about the first 50 or 75 years of St. Bartholomew's. 
And perhaps the history of how it happened is one of the reasons why. It really shouldn't have been here, or if it was to be here, it shouldn't have been a, a church that stood on its own, free from a larger church. There was great competition at the time to build a place here that would be an extension of Christ Church on Spark Street, the establishment church in Ottawa, or St. Albans Church. And of course, no one was much interested in this neck of the woods until the Mackay family sold their property to the government of Canada and the new governor general was to be uh, installed here. However, there isn't really any um, evidence that the governor general had much to do with the start of this church. They certainly helped as when things got rolling. But in one way, how could they? They really weren't here. But the story is that Christ Church wanted to have a place here to extend its influence in the best possible way. Christ Church was a church that charged pew rents, not a free church. It was a, a more practical way from a church financial point of view of collecting money than simply passing the plate around. St. Albans Church was a free church, and the idea was that anyone could come in regardless of their station in life. And of course, we today think of churches as free in that sense, but at the time, it really wasn't the case. So the two vied for this particular area, and up the middle came Thomas Kiefer, uh, a famous name in New Edinburgh, and Kiefer had been a, an engineer, and he'd come and he'd married into the Mackay family. And he had a real hand in first getting the land, and he got the land as a gift from the Mackay estate. And then he had to convince the bishop, who was in Kingston, to allow him to build a church against the opposition of the other two churches I was talking about, Christ Church on Spark Street and St. Albans, to be built on King Edward. And how he did it isn't quite clear. There's a sleight of hand there. Um, here's an excerpt from the history, which I think is illuminating. There is no clear evidence before 1868 that the first Governor General of Canada had anything to do with the founding of the new community of worship in the neighborhood of Rideau Hall. For the next two generations, it could be argued that the founding of St. Bartholomew's was to be regarded in private as little better than an act of supreme folly, a folly appropriate to making Ottawa the capital. In other words, supreme folly because there really weren't enough people here and there wasn't enough money to make a church go. And yet somehow Kiefer managed to have the church declared free here, both free from pew rents and free in the sense that the rector of the church and the wardens were not responsible to anyone, not any other church, of course, to the bishop. And so St. Bartholomew's began, and it was a struggle. It was a very plain church, and various governors general helped. Lady Dufferin, the most, had a large rummage sale to pay off the mortgage in 1873 and that was a wonderful moment when the four thousand dollar mortgage was paid off and the church was free and clear and then could be consecrated and in fact later in the service we'll sing we love this place O lord that hymn was sung in 1873 when the church was consecrated the mortgage having been paid in full the first rector, Mr. Higginson, left after 10 years, and then came Canon Hannington, and he was here for a very long time and much beloved. However, he had high church ways. That's code, for he did things like put candles on the altar. Um, he probably would have communion more than usual. Uh, he would have different kinds of vestments. And these things, enraged a segment of the congregation and they left. About a third decamped in the 1880s for a church a few blocks away. And of course that was a big blow. However, 
they continued. St. Bartholomew's continued. God was faithful to us and we were faithful to God and to the church community of St. Bartholomew's. And on it went. And of course, after World War II, everything changed. The area changed its complexion. And St. Bartholomew's was a very successful church in the sense of being able to pay their own way and be able to do things beyond their borders. And indeed, we still try to do those things. I'm proud that we have given away a very substantial amount of money in the last 10 to 12 years. We've also brought in one refugee family and are in the process of bringing in another two that got delayed because of COVID, but that's going well. So all those things are important. All those things make us give thanks for this place. Um, it makes me think that God had other ideas than just what Thomas Kiefer's ideas were. Thomas Kiefer was looking for a building and a church to make the community more attractive to people moving in, and that's not a bad thing in itself. And yet, so he did that, and in spite of it all, the church held on, and I would say prospered. So we give thanks for that on this day. The Lord be with you. And with my Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, the last and Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. Save the Queen. And you, thy ministers, with righteousness. O Lord, save thy people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, make clean our hearts within us.
Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, the parliaments of the Commonwealth and all who are set in authority under her, including our Prime Minister, Justin, Doug, our Premier, and Jim, our Mayor, that they may order all things in wisdom, righteousness, and peace to the honour of thy holy name and the good of thy church and people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and clergy, especially Linda our primate, Anne our metropolitan, 
Shane, our bishop, and David, Lorette, and Pamela, and this congregation of St. Bartholomew's committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. In our worldwide Anglican cycle, we pray for the church in the province of Uganda. In the diocesan cycle, we pray for St. John the Evangelist, Ottawa, and their rector, Gary, and deacon, Carolyn, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. We also pray for members of the Governor General's foot guards and those serving in diplomatic missions and NGOs, long-term care homes, including the Gary Armstrong home, and our educational system. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in body, mind, or estate. We pray for Abe, Joanne, Lori, Jennifer, Harriet, Michael, Andre, Don, Christina, Hannah and family, Harriet and family, Michael and Kathleen. We take a moment to remember those known to us alone. We pray for those who have died, remembering all who have died from COVID or the displacement of medical treatment because of the pandemic. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, to give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our, in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee and us promise that when two or three are gathered in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as be most, may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. As you can see, I'm outside the church in front of where the original cornerstone was laid. And that image is a good one to announce that we are going to have a special vestry on May 16th, that is two weeks from today. And the vestry is to approve a campaign, a financial campaign to go forward, probably in the fall. And the campaign will focus half of it on the window in our church behind the altar, known as the Ottawa window throughout the world, it's that famous, and the other windows, they all need work, but the window behind the altar needs extensive work. And at the same time, there are a number of other things that need to be done in terms of this building. 
And so we will put the proposal to you at the special vestry and ask for your approval to go forward to begin to raise the funds. As I say, this is the first notice of the vestry and we'll have one next week and the week after. And by next week, you'll have more information about the particulars. Uh, I hope you can join us then May 16th at 11 o'clock. This bush always speaks of spring, and I think I have pictures of its blooms every year since I've been here. I hope you can join us for coffee at 11.15 via Zoom. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, and remain with you and all those whom you love, now and always. And let us say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.